Um, he's an expert in the in physiology of the diseased neonatal lung, and especially as it relates to advanced modes of mechanical ventilation. If you were here last year, he was one of our guests last year, um, so it's uh, excellent to welcome him back. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me back. This is the third time, third course, and um, I think it's a testament to the team here that this lecture theatre is, we're having in a much bigger lecture theatre, this is about three times as many people as last time. So I'm hoping, I think the philosophy I assume has stayed the same, that this is meant to be an interactive learning experience. Ventilation is an interactive experience. It shouldn't be defined necessarily by forest plots. It should be defined by a, a, a re, an interaction, a relationship between the patient and the therapy you're giving as a, as a caregiver. Um, so I would be very happy if you want to interrupt me at any time. Um, please ask questions, please interrupt, it's better we have a discussion um, because the afternoon in the workshop should be about a discussion so it's best you talk now I think. Um, and you've got me unfortunately for about an hour and a half and we're going to talk in the first instance very generically and go back to the very basics of respiratory physiology and what we're trying to do when we put a baby on um, respiratory support and mechanical ventilation and then I'll give an overview of high frequency ventilation um, before the more um, detailed discussions come uh, after morning tea, I gather. So I want to just ask some simple questions. What are we actually trying to do when we put a patient on a ventilator? And none of this is complicated. We're really just trying to do two things. And what are they? Trying to oxygenate and ventilate. It's pretty simple, right? That's all we're wanting to do. So we want to oxygenate the patient because they might be having trouble. Now, we have the poor man's way of oxygenating, which is to use the FiO2 knob, or we could look at how we're recruiting the lung, because as we'll see, the, how we ventilate a patient is an interaction with volume as much as with pressure. And to achieve recruitment, we have a number of different things. We can use PEEP and PIP and the eye time. And I'm going to spend probably most of the time talking about the eye time because time is, again, one of those forgotten components of respiratory physiology when we're at the bedside. And we're hopefully, there we go. And secondly, we're trying to ventilate. And ventilation is simple. It's just about <coughs> CO2 clearance. And CO2 clearance is about minute ventilation. Minute ventilation is the product of rate times the tidal volume minus the dead space. And we need to keep coming back, and I keep reminding our fellows, it's minute ventilation we're concerned about. Tidal volume is just a part of that. Um, and just so often, and when I ask our guys, what are we trying to achieve with minute ventilation, they can't tell me. They can all tell me they want to give four to six mil per kilo. I always then answer with why are we trying to give four to six mil per kilo and where did that number come from? And that's something I'd like you to ponder because I think most people don't know where four to six mil per kilo came from and it's not always the right numbers to give. Um, but vent, minute ventilation is often forgotten. And that's the key. We can't clear CO2 clear if we don't have the right minute ventilation. Tidal volume, of course, is influenced, at least in conventional ventilation, by the delta P, the difference in the PIP and the PEEP, the flow and the resistance of the circuit you're ventilating. So the whole circuit, that includes the lungs itself. And, of course, by the eye time, which I'll get to. And, finally, by the volume state of the lung. Lung recruitment determines minute ventilation. And I'll talk a bit, a bit, bit more about that when we do the high-frequency discussion. But in the diseased lung, particularly the diseased preterm lung, mechanical ventilation is more than just oxygenation and ventilation, isn't it? It's about not injuring the lung more than it is already injured. It's about lung protection. And so we have these three factors. We're trying to achieve oxygenation and ventilation, whilst trying to sail a course between these conflicting causes of lung injury. And the good thing about being a neonatologist is we've become exceptionally good over the decades at injuring the lung, haven't we? We've got lots of ways to do it. What we need to be very careful about is trying to avoid those ways, and they can often put us into trouble. So remember that it's, it's a balance between harm and good. What do we need to think about when we put a baby onto the ventilator? We're taking away at least some of their ability to determine their respiratory physiology and their lung state. We're taking away some of their control of volume, some of their control of tidal volume, and a lot of their control of minute ventilation. 
We're imposing extra work on their system. The lung is just a machine, and it's a machine that's very repetitive, and it has to work harder when it's dealing with the imposed work of breathing of a respiratory circuit. And that's why we often need to use more sedation in term babies and in paediatric patients and in adults than we will in a preterm baby. Preterm babies are good at being ventilated. Term babies are not so good. Um, and that it's counter-physiologically. The normal physiological method of breathing is by negative pressure. When we put a patient on a ventilator, we are applying a positive pressure system to their circuit. What are some of the things we need to ask ourselves when we put a baby on a ventilator? And these are sort of my fundamental five questions, and they're pretty much in the order I'd consider asking them. Firstly, what are we actually treating? And this doesn't need to be overthought. So I'm not, when, you know, I work at a surgical neonatal unit, I'm not interested when someone says we're treating a CCAM. That's not what we're treating. I want to know about the physiological state we're treating at the time. Are we, and it could be very simple, are we treating a problem of compliance? Are we treating a problem of resistance? Are we treating a problem of both? Are we treating a problem of neither, i.e. a surgical baby with no lung disease? Are we treat, and are the consequences of that, are they a problem of atelectasis, a problem of gas trapping, or a problem of something not related to the lung state itself, like pulmonary hypertension, sepsis, and things like that. If you answer those questions, then the way to ventilate becomes much simpler, and you don't need to get caught up in all the details and confusion that often comes from all the different modes and the different names and all of those sort of things. So what are we treating first is what I ask myself. Then I say, what peak might I need for that lung disease and the lung volume and the patient? And then, what inspiratory time will I need to use for the time constant of the respiratory system I'm treating and the baby's own respiratory pattern? Time constants and ventilation are much easier if you must relax all your patients. But it becomes a little bit more complicated when they're breathing as well. Now I can ask myself what PIP to use to produce the tidal volume that I think I might need. And I've put four to six mil per kilo here initially, and I say that as really, really... a a method for the sort of acutely diseased atelectatic preterm baby. I wouldn't necessarily use four to six mil per kilo in all of the babies I'm ventilating at the start. But you see now question four is tidal volume. I think a lot of people get to question four first, but until you get the peak, the disease, the physiology, and the time components of the respiratory system right, what PIP you set and what tidal volume you want to give is somewhat irrelevant because they'll be confined by these other factors. And then finally, what rate is needed to produce the adequate minute ventilation and therefore CO2 clearance? And again, you can see it comes back to minute ventilation. So when we put a baby on a ventilator, what are we trying to do? Well, we're interacting with four things. We're trying to provide a pressure difference. We're trying to do that via a flow of gas into the system. We're doing it over a period of time. All of our ventilators are either time cycle pressure limited or flow cycle pressure limited. And we're trying to eventually initiate a volume change within the lung, both during tidal breathing and at end expiration. And if you understand that, and you understand that this equation, this is all you need to know to ventilate a baby. So I assume on our ward rounds that my fellows can tell me that the right pressure settings to put on a ventilator are equal to E times distance plus resistance times speed plus M times acceleration. This is pretty simple stuff, right? And you've all probably seen this before. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> in fact, you all have seen this before because this is an equation invented by one of the world's best neonatologists, or at least physiologists for the lung, Isaac Newton, correct? This is the, one of, this is the law of motion. Essentially, what we're trying to do is achieve provide enough force to the lung to allow it to move. And if it can move, gas goes in and then gas comes out. Because being a respiratory physiologist is easy. All you need to know is the lung goes up and the lung goes down. And then it goes up again and it goes down. And if you want to be more complicated, when it goes up and goes down, there also needs to be something near it that goes boom, boom. So it goes up, boom, boom, down, boom, boom, up, boom, boom, down, boom, boom. That's all of respiratory physiology. And this is what we're trying to do with a mechanical ventilator, is give enough pressure to initiate the volume change. So to do that, we need to understand what things are stopping the lung moving when we apply pressure to it. So the first thing we do 
is we have to overcome the resistance of the circuit. So we have to think about the things that are stopping gas getting from here, the ventilator, to here, the alveolus. It's an alveolus we're trying to move, but gas has to get there. It has to get there through the circuit, through the endotracheal tube, and then through the airways themselves. So resistance is the first force to overcome. Resistance is related to time. So if you have a high resistance in the circuit, it takes longer for a bit of gas to get from here to here. Now, if you deal just with preterm babies with atelectasis, resistance is negligible, isn't it? They don't have a problem of the airway. They have a problem of the muscles and the chest wall and a problem of the alveolus. But in other patient populations, resistance is very important. So firstly, you have to get the gas there to an alveolus. You also need to do it, you also need to overcome the component of inertience, which fortunately in neonatal patients is negligible, and we don't need to worry about this force whatsoever, which is really good because it's hard to understand. But I'm putting it up there just to show that we should think about it, but you can now stop thinking about it. Once we get gas to an alveolus, there needs to be enough pressure there to initiate a volume change and deliver a tidal volume. And that's got to do with compliance, or in fact it's got more to do with the things that are trying to stop the lung being compliant, the viscoelastic forces of the lung, the things that want to stop it moving. Because the lung likes to collapse. It's designed to be a spring that collapses. And that's very efficient to get gas out. It's not very efficient to get gas in when your whole system isn't working well itself. So we need to provide enough force to overcome the things that are stopping the lung inflating itself. Am I going too quick or, no, okay? Is it all okay, not too simple? Yeah, good. So that's what we need to understand. Resistance and compliance, they're the two things to think about when you decide how to set a ventilator. And if we put that together using Newton's equation of motion and apply it to the lung, and we assume here a single compartment model, i.e. the whole lung is the same, that's of course false. The whole lung is actually a billion little alveoli trying to do a billion different little things. And ideally, we try to get them all to do the same thing, which I'll talk about in the next talk. So we need to apply enough pressure to overcome the resistance of the system and enough pressure to initiate a volume change in the lung, which is related to the compliance of the system. And just to throw it in, we need to balance our European focus and put the French into it. And remember that law of Laplace relates to surface tension in the lung, and that will also dictate how easy it is for the system to be uh, moved. And that's it. I could end there. That's all you need to know. Right? Pretty simple. Okay? So, again, applying this concept of pressure and the forces opposing pressure, it's not the same in inspiration and expiration on a ventilator, is it? Ventilators are lazy. They only work some of the time. So, they're active inspirers or inflators. This is, I just, I know Colin's here. Can I just say, I, I can, I plagiarised the slide from um, Peter Dargaville. I need to change it. It says inspiration, not expiration, because the ventilator is inflating, isn't it? So, um, so it's an active inflator. It's got a constant inspiratory flow going in, but it's a passive expirer. So expiration, though, is the same. The same principles apply. You need to apply, there needs to be enough flow and enough forces overcoming the things stopping the lung deflating. Now, it's pretty easy to deflate, but because it's passive, it will take longer, and that is relevant in some lung conditions. It's fortunately not that relevant in preterm babies, but in other conditions, the, the physiological components and mechanical properties of lung during expiration are much more important than during inspiration. Compliance is the one thing most of us know a lot about. We all know what compliance is. It's how easy it is to move something. So something either wants to move or it doesn't want to move. And if a lung is compliant, it's easy to move it. If a lung's non-compliant, it's not easy to move it. And we know this curve, which I'm not going to talk about now, um, and that we know that during inspiration it's a sigmoid relationship and the um, difference between the um, volume change that occurs between PEEP and PIP um, is related to the compliance of the lung and the pressure that's applied to generate that delta P. And we know that compliance is equal to change in volume over change in pressure. So change in tidal volume over change in delta P. This tells us a fair bit about some of the modes we might be using. This tells us how volume guarantee will move, uh, will work, doesn't it? 
and it tells you that if you set this as a constant, then and this is changing to keep this constant, it's because the patient is changing the system. The mechanical properties are changing and the ventilator is adapting to that. And that's why it's a good thing to do. So compliance is about how easy it is for something to move when it's being asked to move or possibly in the non-compliant system not asked to move. And as I've just said, compliance influences tidal volume. So if we didn't have a patient in volume guarantee or targeted tidal volume, then you can see here if the compliance changes and the lung becomes more compliant at a constant delta P, you'll get an increase in the delivered tidal volume. And that's, of course, what you'd expect to happen if you gave a patient surfactant. And that could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what you want. The absolute numbers are less important than the response the patient is having. Now, as Colin pointed out this morning, it's not just about pressure. When we ventilate a baby, that equation of motion brings in all sorts of other things to think about. Yes, there's a pressure we're applying, but we're doing it with a flow of gas. And flow is really important and never really considered. And I always ask people, I wonder how many times do you think about what flow you're giving to a patient when you ventilate them? And do you ever change the flow? It's about time. It takes time for something to get in and something to get out. So I'm going to talk a bit about time. And ultimately, it's about volume. <coughs> so as I said to you, we've got to overcome these port forces. And the, the tidal volume we give is determined by the compliance of the system and the delta P. Um, but it takes time for that tidal volume to get in. So when we apply a step change in pressure to the system, the volume that changes in the lung is occurring exponentially. It doesn't suddenly go bang to full tidal volume. There's an exponential change in volume. And that exponential change in volume is called the time constant of the system. The time constant of the system tells you how long it takes for that lung to inflate and then to deflate. And that's fundamental because if you don't get that right, even if your delta P is correct for whatever you want, if you don't allow enough time for that pressure to get in, you won't get the tidal volume that you're intending. And you can set it at 4 mil per kilo or 5 mil per kilo, whatever. Um, but if there's not enough time for that gas to get in to give that volume change, what will the ventilator do in a volume control mode or volume guarantee mode? You'll have to keep upping the delta P. So you can see that you can actually be giving a very unlung protective mode of ventilation, even though you think it's being lung protective. Now, the time it takes to get in, or the time constant, is determined by compliance and resistance. These two factors of mechanical motion keep coming back into the equation. We have to keep thinking about them. So all you need to know to set a ventilator and get the right eye time and E time is you just need to apply this equation. It's pretty simple stuff. Okay. Um, and this isn't new stuff. You know, we've been knowing, known about this for a lot longer than probably most people in this room have been alive. And it's pretty simple mass, it's not that hard. Um, this is just a fairly simple exponential model. And you know, whenever I show this, everyone laughs and says, oh, I don't know what anything about this, but all of you have done pharmacology and you all understand about half-lives of drugs. That's all we're applying here. This is essentially about half-lives. It's the same mathematical model. And I have a bit of an interest in mathematical models and ventilation, so I just put them up to confuse people predominantly. Um, what does it actually mean? This is what's occurring when we apply a delta P to the lung. We're initiating a volume change over time. It takes time for it to get in, and it takes time for it to get out. What we obviously want to do is to apply our delta P over enough time that we get to somewhere up here. So one time constant of the lung will deliver 63% of the tidal volume. Five time constants gives almost 100%. Mathematically, you can never get to 100% with this model. Um, Three time constants gives 95. So effectively, you want to provide an I time that is at least three time constants of the respiratory time constant for that baby. So if anyone says to you, I always set my I time at 0.3, they're either only ventilating one baby, and they knew that, or they don't actually understand how to set the I time. Because not every baby needs the same time constant. Not every patient will have the same mechanical state of the lung, and therefore need the same amount of time for gas to get in and out. So you can either sit at the bedside and you can say, OK, I'm going to work out the compliance and the resistance of my system and I'm going to work out the eye time mathematically at the bedside. You can actually do this on a lot of ventilators and because they give you the data if you believe it. Um, or you can look at other things. And essentially the time constant of the lung 
is determined by the mechanical state of the system and also the flow setting you provide to the ventilator because that determines how quickly gas is leaving the ventilator and how quickly pressure is leaving the ventilator. Then how that pressure responds in the lung is determined by the baby's lungs itself. Oh, lost the fonts again like Colin did this morning. So again, thinking about this mathematically, you can see in a normal lung, you have normal compliance and you have normal resistance. So if we take normal compliance at one mil per kilo per centimetre of water and normal resistance as it is up here, you can see that you get a time constant here in this patient um, who's three kilos, for example, of about 0.12 of a second. Three time constants or to five time constants, you can see you're getting up to about the 0.5 plus seconds over a second to give an effective eye time. Very different from what we do in a preterm baby. Okay? But in a preterm baby, what do you have? You have a problem of compliance. Compliance is low, resistance is normal. The lung doesn't need long to get gas in, and if you give enough pressure, it doesn't need long for the system to move. So because compliance is low and resistance normal, we have a very short time constant. And here you can see in a baby with very severe HMD, very short eye time, five time constants is very, very short. And if you've used sort of a pressure support ventilation mode, you see especially if you have a very high flow, some of those babies are generating eye time, the pressure support where you've got a variable eye time, sometimes the ventilator is delivering eye times of 0 0.1, 0 0.15 of a second. And that can sometimes be good, it can often, more than often be bad in these babies. And here flow comes into it. Now, if you have the opposite airway disease, for example, bronchiolitis, you have a significant problem of resistance. It takes a long time for gas to get from the ventilator to the alveolus. Once it gets there, it may move the alveolus easily or it may not because compliance is variable in bronchiolitis. But the key thing here is mathematically, you now have a very long time constant. So if you apply the same eye time you'd apply in a preterm baby to a baby with bronchiolitis, you'll get into a lot of trouble that baby will not ventilate, it will not oxygenate. That's not because of the lung disease, it's because of the clinician. And this is often a problem we see when we get babies come with bad bronchiolitis or bad MAS and they're being referred for high frequency and they're said they need ECMO because they're a failure of high frequency. It's often because they're treating them like a preterm baby. Yeah? Where, where did you get these numbers from? These are public, I don't know the reference for these, but. Um, you can look them up, they're in fairly standard textbooks. But I always, for compliance, I tend to just use one mil per kilo per centimetre of water. It's a nice adult medicine type approach to things, isn't it? Everything's a value of one. So, but it's, don't look so much at the numbers, think about the physiology. And I always ask myself, and I ask the, the fellows, when they're setting the item, I say, what have you got? Is it a problem of compliance or a problem of resistance? You don't need the numbers, because the mass works itself out if you think about it. If the compliance is low, then mathematically you need a, you've got a shorter time constant than you do in a normal lung. Does that make sense? Now I'm going to also show you that I've wasted about five minutes of your life going through all of this mass and you don't actually need any of that. Okay? This just graphically represents the same thing. Again, if you've got a healthy lung, it inflates and deflates pretty easily. Um, if you've got HMD, it doesn't want to inflate. But, it doesn't, but if you apply enough pressure, you might not get much volume in, but you'll get it in quickly. And then chronic lung disease becomes variable, and it depends really at what state of chronic lung disease you're in. Now, you don't need to know any maths because the ventilators, all modern ventilators, give you that information graphically, and they allow you very simply to uh, adjust to the right time constant. And that's because we get the flow wave. And the flow wave is the most important wave on a ventilator because it's telling you about how gas is going in and it's telling you about how gas is going in over time because flow is a measure of volume and time. So we can see here gas goes in, it goes in very quickly and then it's, the flow starts to slow down as we get to this point of zero flow and there's only two points in your respiratory cycle when you have zero flow, isn't there? At the end of inspiration, there's no gas going into the lung and there's no gas going out of the lung. When you get to the end of expiration, there's no gas going out of the lung there's no gas going into the lung. And it's the point where the sign is changing. So if we have a gas going in and then it gets to zero flow, we have to be at end, expiration, end inspiration. And conversely the same. So if we look here, we can see on this flow wave here that gas goes in, we get to end, end inspiration, there's a pause of zero flow and then it goes out again. 
This is a nice balanced wave, isn't it? So whatever the mass, whatever the compliance and the resistance, this eye time is about right. It's giving enough time to get the lung to full inflation. Irrespective of the pressure and volume you're applying, time is enough here. And you're not truncating it early or holding it particularly too long. And this is very efficient. So we don't want to hold the lung open longer than it needs to be. One, the baby doesn't want that. The baby wants to breathe out, and when we hold it open, we're making it much harder for the baby. Um, and it's a waste of time. It gives us less breaths we can get in per minute, and that makes minute ventilation less efficient. And if you're at the boundaries of supporting CO2, the only approach to that is to up your pressure to get more tidal volume in. And it potentially could be injurious to hold that lung open. So what would we do here with this flow wave? Increase the eye time, exactly. And we're wasting time. Here we're not giving enough, and we're not allowing the lung to get to the volume it wants to get to at that pressure. So again, if you were in a volume guarantee type mode, you'd be giving more delta P than you needed to give. So this is interrupted flow. We increase our eye time and it gets to normal flow. The question is then how long should we set our eye time? And the good thing about all of these slides is they're all nice flowways from perfectly no ET leak, nice muscle relaxed babies, it's lovely. This is, this is the advantage, isn't it? Well, this isn't my graph, but this is, the, this is my graph, but this is the advantage of working in a surgical neonatal. Um, so how long should you give? Well, as I said, you need to get to zero flow, but you don't want to just get to zero flow because where are we measuring flow on a mechanical ventilator? Here, it's at the airway opening, right? I'm not treating flow sensors measuring here. I'm treating alveoli and lungs. Still takes a bit of time to get there. And all of this stuff I've told you is assuming the lung is just one big balloon. It isn't. It's lots of different balloons. And they all want to do their own thing. They need, it'll take time for gas, not very much time, to get out past the flow sensor into the lung. And then, especially in an atelectatic lung, you've got a, a lung that wants to be heterogeneous in its volume state. You then need to give enough time for that little avalanche effect to occur in the lung and allow all the alveolar to try to recruit themselves and ventilate. So you want to hold zero flow for a little bit longer. But it should be less than a third of total eye time. Once you get too long, then you're basically holding a lung open that doesn't need to be open. So it should be ideally less than a third and a little bit of a plateau. And then you know you've got enough eye time. What do you do in the real world when you have a leak? Oh, it's, all my animation's gone crazy. So, so this might be a nice flow wave, but reality is most of our babies have a leak. How, we are never going to get to zero flow if you have a leak because it's impossible. Because some of the gas has left the circuit, flow sensor can't measure it anymore. You can still look for a plateau, you've just got to offset it visually in your mind. So in this case, we're probably still applying more eye time than we need to. We probably could go a little bit shorter. Um, just a quick question. Though. Yeah. Because I mean, we're talking about like inspired or flow versus inspired. Because right? there's always going to be flow. Yes. Yeah. I'm just at the moment, moment just took me this You're just talking about inspired. Yeah. Right? So you never get a point of zero flow, right? Because yeah. you still need that. When you have a leak. Well, but the flow sense is showing a point of zero flow. Yeah. Where it's changing. Well, it just means you're always going to have. Exactly, yeah, yeah, but it's turned. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. you've got more flow coming out yeah. because the system wants to collapse. The <laughs> lung wants to deflate all the time. Yeah. yeah. So, but, like, sometimes you might say, here's zero flow. I'm talking about what the flow sensor's seeing. Yeah. 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 But it's still a point of essentially zero flow in your lung, isn't it? It has to be. Because you're doing it right now. <gasps> with no gas going. <laughs> yeah. Now there's gas but going. But there's still always. Yeah, yeah. I, I think but when you get into the constant pressure because of the peaks and stuff, just like I'm just that constant that there's still always a bit of flow. But it's a balance of yes. flows going in a different direction. We just exactly. see the sum of all of that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, um, so, yeah, but I'm talking just about inspiration now because on a mechanical ventilator, you set your eye time, your rate is effectively a product of your eye time and your E time. If you don't get enough gas in, you can't get the right gas out. Or if you get too much gas in, you can't get the right gas out. And you can't set your rate until you know how much time you need to inflate the lung because it sets the boundary of how much time, the, how much rate you can give the lung. You may want to give the baby 60 breaths per minute, 
but if you've got a baby with bronchiolitis, that's not going to happen because you need so much time to get gas in and it constrains your time in getting gas out. So when you have a leak, you have to just look at the size of the leak and remember that you can still look for a plateau or effectively near a plateau. Now, if you have a large leak, this is all irrelevant. So when you have a very, very large leak, none of this is going to work. And really, you have to do the thing that has kind of helped people in medicine for a while now, which is to actually look at the patient. Because the patient, as Colin keeps telling you when you're a fellow in Melbourne, the baby knows better than you do. And let the baby tell you stuff as well. And you can actually watch chest wall movement. It doesn't hurt anyone to do it. So, and it's quite useful sometimes. Um, we also need to think about flow. So yes, I've told you about the confinements of the lungs mechanical state, but we also are setting flow. And you can see here, this is one of Jane's slides, um, if we have a very high flow, what happens? Gas will go very quickly into the lungs, irrespective of the mechanical state of that lung. Gas goes in quickly and it initiates a very, very quick pressure change and a very, very quick volume change. Then gas goes out. So that gives you a very, very short, it'll shorten your eye time compared to if you set your flow lower. If you have a low flow, it takes longer for gas to get in for the mechanical state of that lung. Who cares? What, is there any reason why we should care about this? Well, there might be, because fast flow in the wrong conditions creates shear stresses on the airway and the alveolar surface. And we all know about shear force injury yeah, as a way of causing lung injury. This is how it occurs mathematically, and of course, if it occurs mathematically, it must be true. Um, so, um, but it's a relevant factor. If flow is too fast, then we may be pushing very, very high pressures very quickly into the lungs. So if you think about it, fast flow is this, right? Okay, if you've got a very preterm baby with really nasty HMD, which none of you probably ever see anymore, um, this might not be very, very good for it. You may want to do this, yeah? The very preterm baby with very, very nasty HMD allows you to use a low flow because the compliance is exceedingly low, the resistance is normal, the inspiratory time constant and the expiratory time constant in that lung is very short. So you can give the lung more time to inflate still and still manage to achieve minute ventilation, i.e. get enough breaths in per minute or allow the baby to have enough breaths per minute. So I personally don't use very fast flows when I'm putting a baby with active HMD or very, very nasty atelectasis um, and very short time constant systems onto mechanical ventilator. I would intentionally use a low flow. I don't go quite as low as Jane Pillow does. Jane says she never puts babies on more than two litres per minute. So they need to be ventilated in the first day of life with severe HMD and she has to ventilate them. Um, I probably don't go quite that low, but I would use very, very low flows and I don't just go, I should leave it at six to eight because the lung allows you to do that and it may well be lung protective. I'm now talking about a randomised control evidence-free zone though. Um, the modern ventilator makes it hard to change flow, doesn't it? Most of you probably got a ventilator that has taken away the flow knob. In the old days, they all had a flow knob, but generally the flow knob was so rusted over that you couldn't change it anyway. It's a bit like the peat knob, wasn't it? You know? so, um, so how do you change flow on a modern ventilator? Sorry? Yeah, what's the rise time? So they've given them all a fancy term. Instead of having flow, which most of us vaguely knew what that was, now they have rise time. And then they have the little graph of the square wave and the more curvy wave, yeah? So the more curvy the wave, the slower the flow is going into the ventilator, obviously. So use rise time. Yeah? Yeah. So if you, I don't have a whiteboard marker, I like whiteboard markers. So what, if you've got really bad HMD, do you need much time for gas to get into the lung? No. It's easy to get gas there. The problem is moving the thing is really hard because of the poor compliance, right? So getting gas in is easy. You've just got to apply that gas at a sufficient pressure to initiate the volume change. So the lung is allowing you to give lots and lots of breaths. And if you look at the flow waves in an exceedingly nasty case of HMD, you could give 
more than 80 breaths per minute quite comfortably without causing auto peak. Yeah? Um, so you don't need to do that. We rarely need to do that. So because you've got a very fast system in the patient, you can give a slower flow and still allow enough breaths per minute ventilation. <coughs> Now we come to expiration, and you need to turn the wave and look at what happens in expiration, but the same thing applies. We need to have enough time for gas to get out, otherwise we create auto peak. And here you can see we've got a very nice set inspiratory wave. We're allowing gas to leave the lung, and there's a long pause here. So clearly we're at steady state, we've emptied the lung of gas, then the next breath starts. And as we increase the resistance in the system, you can see that now we've got to a situation where gas is not allowed to leave the lung. It's not finishing emptying before the next breath starts. That'll create auto peak, that'll make it harder to ventilate and all your numbers are gonna go the wrong direction. So in this circumstance, we need to decrease our rate or increase our expiratory time, depending on how we set the, what sort of ventilator you've got. The I time's about right. So irrespective of what the CO2 is here and irrespective of what tidal volume we think we wanna give, we need to give less breaths. Now, if your minute ventilation becomes a problem, the only way to solve this then would be to increase your delta P or increase your tidal volume. And here, the rate's been decreased, and you can see we're now allowing the lung to properly empty. Yeah? And again, in this case, if at the bedside I was asked, given a CO2 of 80, and the nurse or somebody said, what do you want to do on the ventilator? I look here. Here, the answer is clear. I need to increase minute ventilation. I've got rate. I've got tidal volume. Assuming my tidal volume is sufficient for the dead space of the system and I'm actually washing the lung out of gas, the solution here is to increase my rate because I've been told that's lung protective. Lots of small breaths as often as possible. And the baby is telling you with the ventilator how to fix its CO2 right now by using time constants and flow rates. In this case, increasing the rate won't fix my CO2. In fact, I decrease the rate. Then I think about whether I need to increase my delta P. And as I've just showed you, we need to think about the concept of auto peak. although again in preterm babies it's not quite as relevant as it is in the bigger, buffier, harder to ventilate baby. And as I've said to you, resistance is the key here. Resistance is more relevant in expiration because the lung is passive when it expires, it takes longer for gas to get out than it takes to gas to get in, hence we have longer expiratory times and inspiratory times on ventilators. And that's why we don't like reverse ratios too often. So what do we do in this baby, who is currently on, um, this is a four kilo X-prem uh, uh, bronchiolitis baby, who's currently got a nasty blood gas, he's on volume uh, targeted ventilation, volume guarantees, therefore it must be optimal, um, because we know that. And we're currently giving almost 10 mils, uh, eight mils per kilo, and the CO2 is still high. So we're giving four mils per kilo, but we're giving very, very high pressures. Now this is an Australian baby, so for, there's only two places it can go put on the jet. So don't say the jet if you're in the southern. I know you've got more here, but in the southern hemisphere, there's only two locations for the jet, okay? Um, so we're not talking about cities here, we're talking about hemispheres when it comes to the jet south of the equator. So what are you gonna do? Sorry? Sorry? Yeah? So you're giving enough time for inspiration, aren't you? But you've got a bit of auto peep, haven't you? Yeah? So you need to slow your rate. Now, if you do that, you need to look at your minute ventilation too. So our minute ventilation here is 600 uh, mil, four kilo baby. It's only about 120 mil per kilo per minute. So that's probably going to be, that's the reason why you have a bad CO2 as well. You've got insufficient minute ventilation and gas trapping occurring by auto peak. So you're gonna to have to attend to both. And here you're in a bit of a bind because we're giving pretty high pressures, right? Your peak might not be right, um, but you're gonna to have to give more tidal volume if you slow your rate down because it's the only way to get your minute ventilation up. So in this case, you would hope you've got a unit with the jet potentially, um, or you could oscillate, but then you might get into trouble there. So this is the complexities, but it, it really sort of emphasizes the concept of considering expiration as well. And I'm just going to finish by talking about pressure. So when we apply pressure, we initiate a volume change. And I've talked about tidal volume. 
Now I'm going to talk about end expiratory volume. And we need to understand this relationship, which is the quasi-static pressure volume relationship of the lung, where it's more importantly, it's just how much volume get you get in when you give a pressure. And you can see as you take the lung from FRC and you start increasing the pressure you apply to the lung, very little things happen initially. And then suddenly you get to this point, we all know this, this is the lower inflection point of the lung and we've all been told we have to apply peak quite reasonably above the lower inflection point of the lung. Then you get a change in your pattern of, of uh, the relationship between volume and pressure. There's a sign change and you get into this linear part of the curve. This is where we're told that compliance is best because compliance is delta V over delta P. And then as we get up more and more pressure, we start to over distend the lung and we cause a worsening of our lung mechanics again as we go up towards total lung capacity. What happens when you decrease the pressure? The lung doesn't do the same thing. It's got volume history. It remembers what happened to it before. It's cleverer than you, okay? And it's a very springy system. It's not a linear system. It's elastic and springy and does lots of cool stuff. So it has this concept of hysteresis, which means that it deflates in a different way. And you can see here that it deflates such that it holds its volume and to a much lower pressure than was needed to get it to inflate. And that's what hysteresis is about, that the lung has different volumes for any given pressure. And a recruited lung behaves differently from an unrecruited lung. We'll talk a bit more about that with high frequency next. Oh, I've lost all my fonts there. The key thing about hysteresis and pressure is that each alveola is slightly a bit different and that gravity is an important factor, at least in adults. I'm sceptical that gravity is a big issue in preterm babies because I think they're a lot smaller um, and there's less effect for gravity. And whenever we look at regional ventilation in these babies, they don't have anywhere near as much gravity dependency as adults do. Um, but this is work from adult patients. The opening pressure of the lung, so the pressure needed to get the lung to start recruitment is quite high, 20 centimetres of water. Um, but the pressure that allows the lung to collapse once it's recruited is very, very low. And that's that concept again that for any given pressure, there's a lot of different volumes. And for any different volume you want in the lung, there's a lot of different pressures that can deliver it. You've got to work out the right one. And we also have to remember that unfortunately, the lung happens to be connected to less relevant organs like the heart. Um, and that as we inflate the lung, we can make perfusion better. Here you can see a very atelectatic lung. You can see there's a big, different, a big distance between the very, very small gas spaces to the capillaries. As we recruit the lung, that gets better. We've got more gas. We're going to get better perfusion and diffusion. And then when we over inflate the lung, we might have more gas in the lung, but we're squishing everything around it and we're going to impair perfusion again. So we have to remember we are interacting with um, other organs. So just to summarise, I've got two minutes for questions. To ventilate any patient with any modality and any type of ventilation, you need to understand the patient. And the patient's telling you information about the time constants, the compliance and resistance, these three mechanical properties, and they allow you to individualise the care irrespective of what your personal preference is for modality. Um, and the general principles of these relationships between inspiratory and expiratory time and tidal volume are that the absolute maximum tidal volume is determined by compliance in delta P and the I time is relative to the time constant of the lung and that's, that in fact is what is also determining the maximum tidal volume you can give. Flow and pressure waveforms on ventilators tell us a lot. But at the end of the day, good respiratory support it's not about under reading randomised controlled trials of ventilator modes. That's important, but you have to apply all that information by actually sitting at the bedside, watching your patient, learning from what the baby's giving us, from all the different ways they can, and then trying to understand the best way to do that. And again, to finish, if anyone asks me what is the right mode to use, what is the right setting to use, there's only one answer, and I try to tell our fellows on their first date orientation, if anyone asks you any respiratory physiology questions on their ward rounds from the attendings, you just got to give one answer, and that answer is, it depends. Okay? And if then someone says, what does it depend on? You say, it depends on the mechanico, the respiratory properties, the, 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 sorry, depends on the pathophysiological and the mechanical properties of the lung at this point in time. Usually that shuts everyone up. Okay? <laughs> so, thank you.
Are there any further questions?